All right. Yeah, I'm on. Okay, great. Ted, are you still there? I am. Okay. Brother Ted, I owe you an apology. I was picking on you publicly. I really am trying not to do that. The, your strengths are your weaknesses. The Lord, the Lord gave me a witty mind, but I can't shut it up. The, the mind, mouth speaks before the brain works. I love you. I love you too, brother. It's just not good. It's just not good. It, it, mouth talks and brain's just not, not, in, not in. Okay. Oh. It's, it's like coming out my mouth. I'm like, ah! And it's gone. All right. We are studying on Abraham's life. And as I said last week, in week two, we're going to be covering this, this walk of faith, walking in faith and also walking in fear, and the world's watching. That's what we're going to talk about today. Next week, we're going to talk about promises and consequences in those areas where God was definitely working in Abraham's and Sarah's life to fulfill some big things. Uh, we're going to see some big things, too, as we talk about this walk of faith. But when, when we get into it, you, we, they're going to come to a point where we're going to look at the positive things that, that Abraham did and some of the negative things that Abraham did. And it's easy to sit back like we are now and criticize. That, that part's easy to do. We say, hey, you know, Abraham wasn't that good anyway. I don't know why he, everybody just thinks so much of him. Like, look at look that stupid thing he did. I would never do that. We see those kind of things, so it's easy to sit back and criticize. How many of you would like everything you've done right and wrong, written down for all of us to look at for the next 4,000 years? No, Lord. There's just a couple. I don't even want anybody to know. But, but the Lord, for our benefit, has allowed this stuff to be written down so that we can come back and study it and absorb it for the purpose that we might not sin against him. Right. For the purpose that we might see that example and walk in faith just like Abraham did. Amen. So my hope is when we, when we get through this the, the message today, that what you'll see is you'll see that Abraham wasn't a perfect person. Now, I don't see any perfect people out there either. We're not perfect people. And when we walk along in that walk of faith, it's about building that relationship with, with God. Before we get into some of those sub-stories, though, so because we're going to get into that, and, I'm, and, and there's some things that I'm going to be critical about what happened, how some of those things went. I want you to, we're going to come to the end of the story. Now we're going to go to the end of the story for a little bit. We're going to look at what some of the writers have written and what God said about Abraham. Because when we, when we see the summation, when we get to the end of Abraham's life, and God says, this is what I think about Abraham, when we realize what God thinks about Abraham, and then we go back and look, yeah, but he wasn't a perfect person. That should be encouragement to us, folks knowing that we can walk along in our life too, not perfect, certainly making mistakes, certainly making bad decisions, certainly in areas totally wrecking our life. There's, there's times we're going to make decisions and God's going to make us live out those consequences. We're going to see sometimes where Abraham had to live out some consequences. We're going to see sometimes though when, when God protected Abraham from Abraham. We're going to see sometimes where, where Abraham's making some really bad calls and God's got to say, whoa, 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 I've got to stop that because you're going to, we're going to mess up the, the promises that I have for you if I let that happen. So God protected Abraham from Abraham. I'll bet you God's protected you from you at times. And I bet you sometimes when he said, no, we're going we're to let that one stick. We're going to let that one happen. We're going to let that, that thing happen and, and uh, we're going to live with those consequences. That happens too sometimes. Just as a reminder that we're not all we think we are. Uh, we, we as people are very self-centered, very selfish. But this walk of faith that we're going to be talking about today, not just Abraham's, but I want, I want us to keep relating that back to our walk of faith. I'm going to start with a verse out of Romans. I'm going to end at the end with verses out of Romans. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, it says this, folks. For therein is the righteousness of God. Where's the righteousness of God? Therein is the righteousness of God revealed, get this, now get this, this is where the righteousness of God is, it's revealed in faith to faith. 
as it is written, the just shall live by faith, not by fear. The just shall live by faith. Now, what does that mean, this faith to faith? Let me just help you get your, your head around that. Because what the writer's talking about, what Paul's talking about when he wrote that to the Roman Christians is, is when we are walking with the Lord, he's going to ask us to step out in faith. And, and when we're a young believer in that walk, it's going to be like, okay, Lord, you said you got me. Oh, 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 oh. And then the Lord comes to you like, oh, that was cool. What a ride. And then the next time he comes in and he steps in by faith. And the next time. And the next time. And after a while, it's like, no problem. Lord, I don't care what you put in front of me. I know you've got my back. You've always had my back. You've always come through. You've always protected me. I've never starved. I've never lived on our roof. And the Lord repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly has, has met your needs and the things you need. And, and when, you, when you come alongside a saint that's been through that part, that, that part of their life where they just trust the Lord fully, Oh, I love being around saints like that. Because they just like, yeah, no problem, whatever, take me. Oh, you want to kill somebody? Here, I'll get in front. I, they just have full trust that the Lord will provide. So, so when Paul's talking about this faith to faith, he's talking about, yeah, I know the first one's going to be scary, second one, third one. But when you walk a life of walking by faith, expecting and, and seeing the Lord act, that's where righteousness is revealed. It's revealed when we walk by faith. Because when the world's watching and they see a believer who's walking faith to faith and does not get rattled when the whole world blows up, what do you think they see? They see Christ. And what they say is, I'm not sure what Brian's smoking, but get me a little of that. I'm not sure what Brian's drinking, but get me a little bit of that. And what we're drinking and what we're smoking is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our hope is at. And when we walk along in that kind of faith and the world sees it, they know it and they recognize it. They still may reject it. They still may reject it, but they go, that's what I want. They just struggle making that decision because they think, they think they're giving up everything, selfishness, to get the thing that they see that they want. So they can't, they can't do it. It's that tension. So they, they keep going down the path of selfishness. Dave Summerton and I were talking last night about, about this, this trying to ride the fence. And as Dave was saying last night, he's, he's getting it. There is no fence. You either are with the Lord or you are not with the Lord. There's no fence. But so many times you see people straddling the fence. They, they think they can put a foot in the church and they think they can put a foot in the world and it flies. It doesn't fly, folks. And the world watches it and they go, well, if that's the kind of, is that what Christianity is all about? I don't want any of that. Those people at the church, all they do is fight. They can't get along. They've they got so many denominations and all that. I don't want to be any part of that. But then they see a church like the Genesee Country Church and like, what are they doing over there? What are they doing? That doesn't make any sense at all. I don't know what they're doing over there. Must be a cult. Must be a cult. <laughs> they're saying praise Jesus and everything. They even raise their hands. When we show the kind of love to each other that just is not normal, and we walk in faith trusting God to do things which is not normal, they go, that's the hope. The world goes, that's the hope that I want. Amen. So that's what we're going to look at in, in Abram's life today, and we'll, we'll see if we can't see some of that in, our, in ourselves as well. Let's open with prayer, then we'll get right into it. Heavenly Father, this whole idea, this whole thing of walking in faith, Lord, at times just makes no sense to us. But let, Lord, you've called us to do that. The very act of salvation, the thing that you died on the cross for, that you call us to, it's by faith. Father, we can't do anything to earn it, otherwise we'd boast about it, and Lord, you know, we'd boast. But since we can't boast about it, it is simply by faith that we believe in you. Father, we pray that we'll get, kind of comprehend these things so that when we leave here, we'll be stronger in our faith walk. And those moments when we waver, when we're out there in the real world and, and, the, and the, the waves are hitting the shore hard and tall, that we will be able to make decisions. We'll be able to walk forward in faith, trusting you, Lord, to be in our life as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
So we're going to go back and just look at some of, before we go back into Genesis and look at the specific events in Abraham's life, we're going to look at some, some other verses that other writers have written and some things that God himself has said so we get our head around it. So in Acts chapter 7, you don't have to turn there for, for speed. I've got a ton of stuff to cover today, so we'll be moving fast. For speed, let me just read some of this to you. So in Acts chapter 7, the Pharisees are, are hammering Stephen. This is where Stephen gives his his great message to the high priest, and they end up stoning him in the end. But he gives this history lesson to them, and he says to them, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to Abraham, our father. You know, our father, the idolater, the guy that was in Mesopotamia that was following idols. He appeared to him there when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, Go. Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Verse 4, then Abraham went out from the land. And after his father died, God moved him from there into this land where you're now living. So he's talking to them, the Pharisees, and they're standing on the land that God promised Abraham and has given his children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and they're standing there on the land, the promised land, but they've missed the whole point. And yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. So when he made these promises to Abraham in Mesopotamia, he hadn't had any of that yet, but he did bring Abraham and he did give it to him and he did give it to the children. And folks, Pharisees, you're standing right here. You're here. You're proof that they did it. Hello? So he's reminding them. And what did they do for that? They stoned him and killed him. Isaiah 41, verse 8. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, so it's God speaking firsthand. Isaiah 41, 8 says this. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. So Isaiah, speaking, is writing for God in first person, says, Abraham's my friend, and I've given him, you, the Jews, the Israelites, the land. To, because of Abraham, my friend. God called Abraham his friend. At the end of Abraham's life, God said, he's my friend. Don't lose that. We'll come back to that. Second Chronicles 20, verses 5 through 7. Uh, King Jehoshaphat is surrounded on all sides. There's armies all the way around him. He's now standing up on the, the Temple Mount, and he's talking to all of Judah and Israel. And he offers up this high prayer, this prayer, as he stands in the assembly and or first, second Chronicles 20, 5 through 7 says this. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God, our fathers, our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people of Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Jehoshaphat's reminding God, didn't you give this land forever because Abraham's your friend? Don't let, him, don't let the bad guys get me now. He's calling on God, reminding God what God's promises are. And God delivered. That's Jehoshaphat reminding the Jews that Abraham was God's friend. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Let me ask you. When you got saved, was it by the works of the law or by faith? By faith, right? Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, that you're, now you're being perfected in the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law, or does he do it by the hearing of faith? Verse 6, Galatians 3, verse, chapter 3, verse 6. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness... Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. By faith, right? By faith. 
Verse 7, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. It's the sons, the ones that are saved by faith that are the sons of Abraham. What did the Jews keep, keep saying? Abraham's our father. Abraham's our father. Abraham's our father. But Paul reminds the Galatians, no, no, the, the children of Abraham are the ones that, that walk in faith, not the ones that walk in the law. Because we're not saved by the law, right? right. He's reminding them that. And because of that, he, he's pointing out that Abraham is the prototype of faith. He's the prototype of a Christian. He's a prototype of a faith walk. And I'll remind you that he lived 500 years before the law was even written. Abraham did not create the law, write the law, follow the law. He was an idolater. He was an unsaved man living in an unsaved place where craziness happened. And God said, believe me. And Abraham believed him and walked by faith. And if God said, go, he went. Verse 14, I'm going to jump down to 14. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Get that? Written to the, written to the Galatians. So in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham. So this blessing of Abraham, that he would bless all the families of the earth, that's the promise that promise goes way beyond Israel, way beyond the Jews, and it's bestowed on us, as he's pointing out here. So that in Jesus Christ, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. I'd be a Gentile. How about you folks? We, because of Abraham, set that precedent. Because of Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, we can, by faith as Gentiles, become heirs. Folks, that's exciting. That's exciting. Hebrews chapter 11, the great, the great hall of faith chapter, starting at verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. There's, there's hope, but it's assurance of hope. I believe it. I believe it. It's going to happen. It's assurance of hope and the conviction or evidence of things not seen. So we don't even need to see it because what we see before us is the evidence. When we, back Genesis 1.1, when we see creation, when we look across the horizon, and we see creation. That's the evidence that I can believe, easily believe in God. I study that, and you look at it. You cannot pick up a leaf and tell me, that's a nice random leaf. The very pattern on a single leaf would be engineered. If you saw it any other place, you'd say, hmm, I wonder what engineer did that. Then you pick up the next leaf, and it's engineered as well, but it's different. Then you pick up the next leaf, and it's engineered as well, but it's different. And you pick up the next leaf, and it's engineered as well, it's different. And it's so cool that they have to have guys like Chip Malone figure it out and tell us all about it. I, I, I don't know how you can look at these things and not clearly understand that faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Or faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 2, Hebrews 11, verse, verse 2. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Jumping down to verse 8 in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place and he was, received, and he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. He just went. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, his heirs. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Ooh, that's deep. We'll touch on that in a second. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man... And him as good as dead. So Abraham, since he's past the age of having children, he's as good as dead when it comes to having children, was bor were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Down to verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they've been thinking of that land from which they've gone out, they would, not, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he is preparing for them a city. 
the New Jerusalem, right? So are, was Abraham's home really in Ur? No, not really. Was it really in Jerusalem? No, not really. His home really is in, and he was looking for, the New Jerusalem, the new city that God's preparing now. And we too, folks, this is not our world. We are strangers. We are aliens in this world. We too are looking for that new city. If you want to read about that city, go to Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 27. And you can read about that city. That's where our citizenship resides. That's where it resides. Now I'm going to skip, go down to verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in fact the offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And he considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, which is figuratively speaking, and he did receive him back. God is the provider. Then over to James, Christ's half-brother. He said this about, about Abraham. In James chapter 2, verses 18, starting at 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. So that, that section of scripture tends to always confuse people. Wait, Mike, you just said it was by faith, not by works. What's James saying? What James saying is, if, if God said to Abraham, go, and Abraham never went, is that faith? No, we've got, it's faith when God says, go, and then you go. Amen. So we, we can't just walk the aisle, I'll put it in that vernacular, but then never do anything about our salvation. The evidence of our salvation is when you allow the Spirit to work in your life and you start saying things different and talking different and walking different and the things that are important to you are different. The things that you're trying to accomplish in life are different. You start loving your neighbor when you didn't love your neighbor. You start doing things for others that you never think of. You go to Nicaragua or Costa Rica or Sudan when why would you ever want to go there? There's nothing you, you presented... Uh, Noel, that maybe you wanted to go to Costa Rica, by the way, not even as a tourist. But my heart was, was deep in compassion, wanting to go because, because of the need. You don't, you don't do that because you're selfish. You do that because you're not selfish. You do that because the Spirit is working in your life in such a way that it changes the way you think. It changes the way you act. And it changes the things you do works. And that's what James is talking about. Okay, so laying that foundation, so we look back on Abraham from the end of the book, and it says, Abraham was a friend of God, was counted unto him as righteousness. He was the one that stepped out when, he, when God's wanted to go, he went. Now let's look at some specific instances of his life. Now I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Genesis chapter 12, if you would. So go to Genesis chapter 12. And we'll kind of do this together. Now I need my glasses. All right. So I want to look at some of the things where I'm going to start with three times in Abraham's life where he did not make good decisions, where the Lord had to intervene because of the things he was attempting to do. And they're, they're fails on Abraham's part. Again, I can be encouraged that Abraham failed and he's still called a friend of God because I know that I've failed. But, we, but there's things here to learn. So Genesis chapter 12, we're going to pick it up though at verse 10. So there was a famine in the land, so Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. First, so let's just stop there for a second. So the, the writer here, probably Moses, the writer here provides the excuse. Hey, there's a famine in the land. There's a good reason to leave the promised land that I just sent you to. Abraham had just made the big walk from Ur up to Haran, all the way down in, into Canaan. So he's in Canaan, and then he, there's a severe famine. And I think we can surmise when we come to the end of this story that God did not want him to go down to Egypt. Now, he did. It's part of the story, so we, we can see that. But he went. Verse 11, And when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarah, his, 
Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they'll say, this is my wife. I want her. And they will kill me, but they will let you live. When he was saying that to her, was he trusting in God to protect him or was he operating out of fear? He's operating out of fear. The Lord has protected him all the way from Ur, that several thousand mile walk up to, up to Haran, down to the Canaan land. He trusted God. He went. God said, go. He went. And he gets to the promised land and then this, this famine sets in. But it was a severe famine. And he, he quits trusting God. He doesn't look to God for the reason or what's going on. He just says, well, there's a famine in the land. I, I, I got to go down there. I know they got food. But then, but then he's afraid. He's afraid. And so he, he gets Sarah to lie with him, to lie, to not tell the truth. Verse 13, tell them you're my sister that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared for your sake. Now, she was his half-sister. So they haven't quite fully lied, but they've certainly used it as a deception to the Pharaoh. So because the, Abraham knows, Abram knows when he says this to the Pharaoh, that she's single then. She, she must be available. So the deception was to, to save his own skin. So he's not trusting the Lord. Verse 14. And when Abraham entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dwelt, for her sake, he dwelt with, he dealt with Abram, and he had sheep and oxen and male donkeys and male servants and female servants and female donkeys and camels. So Abram had all this stuff and Pharaoh was helping, give, providing the provisions to help him take care of all of his stuff while he's taking in Sarai. Verse 17, But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. Now Pharaoh doesn't know it's Abraham's wife. And the Lord's now starting to afflict his house. God to the rescue there, folks. God to the rescue. Why would, why would God do that? Because they've got as a plan for Abraham and Sarah, and it, the plan will get a little bit messed up if Pharaoh then takes Sarah's wife and then they start having a relationship. It's a problem. God had to intervene because Abraham made some bad decisions. So Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her as my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and get out of here. Get out of here now. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning them, and they sent them away with his wife and all that he had. And where'd they go? Back to the promised land. Folks, the world is watching. So... Abraham lied to this unsaved king. God had to appear to the unsaved king and say, don't do that. You're going to be violating this woman. That's a big deal. That's a big problem. And Abraham gets sent out by the Pharaoh with his tail between his legs. That's a classic fail, folks. And the world was watching, and he didn't do well there. He should have seen God as his provider, but for whatever reason, he was walking along in his life at that time, he and Sarai, and they were, they were weak in their faith. It was one of those moments where they were just like down here. And they didn't have anybody to turn to, and they were making their decisions out of the weakness of the human spirit. Have you ever been there? Folks, what would we do, or what should we do, if we're in one of those low moments and we're feeling really stupid and we're looking to make some really bad decision? Would we go to our multitude of counselors? Would we come to prayer meetings and say, pray for me, man. I, I'm really struggling with this thing. Pray for me. There's this physical thing going on. Pray for me. I'm going to have to move to Portland, Oregon, where all the fruits and nuts are. <laughs> pray for me. We, we have things that we can do, folks. We should learn from this. Don't just do stupid things in your own selfishness, in your own ignorance, in your own arrogance. Don't just do stupid things. In this case... God stepped in and rescued them and stopped something bad from happening. This whole plan that God had would have been totally derailed if Pharaoh would have taken her in as his wife and, and done other things. But God had a plan, so it, the plan was going to be fine, but it's not because Abraham was making great decisions. It was fine because God is always faithful, always. God is good all the time, right? Amen. Amen. Okay, flip over to Genesis chapter 16. 
Another time when they just were struggling making good decisions. Now, can I? It's easy for me to be up here and criticize what Abraham and Sarah are doing and the decisions they're making, but there's a lot of things that are just extenuating circumstances. It's easy to, I could put myself in their circumstances and go, I get that. I get that totally. So, Sarah and Abraham, verse 16, chapter 1. Now, Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. Clock's ticking, like the one right here in front of me. Clock's ticking. And she had a female Egyptian servant. Where'd she get that Egyptian servant? Where'd they just come from? Egypt. They just, she, they just picked her up. She's on the train now. So they pick up this Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant that it may be that I can obtain children by her. Stop just there for a second. Has God ever sometimes said, I want you to go do this thing, but wait for the, get the, wait for the timing. I'll make it happen, but there's a different timing. And we sit there and go, been a, been a day now, been a week now, been a month now. I don't think God has the answer. I think I'll just take care of this one myself. This is the little thing. And this is one of the things that we, we really mess up in life. When, when we look at this, we're going to see that on the big things, it really appears that Abraham was got it. When the big things are right in front of him, he was like, let's go, God. You say go, and I'm going to go. You say sacrifice my son, and I'm going to sacrifice my son. But this, this thing, I, I can handle this one. This one I can handle, Lord. Just, just give me Hagar, and we'll take care of this thing. Well, I'll, I, I'll fix your plan, God. I got a better idea than probably you have. We do that all the time. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarai. Bad idea. So after Abraham had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, so now they're around the 85, 86, Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar and conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. So Hagar is now looking with contempt on her mistress, Sarai. And then Sarai says to Abraham, May the wrong done to me be on you. Am I the only one that looks at that and goes, Wait a minute. You, it's your fault. You, you put that there. You told me to do that. When we start making bad decisions then every, the things that are really illogical seem to start to sound right. So, yeah, I, I may have given it to you, Abram, but it's your fault. You figure it out. I'll, if, if there's any punishment for this one, it's on you. I had nothing to do with it. You went in there and you did those things. How often when we sin, it's easy to sin again or lie to cover it or do this to be deceptive. It's so easy to do that, folks. We, it gets illogical. So Abraham punts it back and he says to her, hey, she's, she's yours. She's your servant. Do it whatever you want. So Sarai sends her away. Total human compassion gone for Hagar. And she gets out in the wilderness and God comes to her and God rescues Hagar and says, hey, I got big plans for Sarah, Sarai and Abram, but I got plans for you too. Go back, submit to, ha submit to Sarai, your, 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 your master, and, and I will take care of you. You will have children too. And they'll be as numbers in great numbers as well as the sand of the seashore but they're going to be a little wild and they're going to be a little bit of trouble for all the world but but the, but i'm going to take care of you and he does this is one of those ones where god allowed it to happen sin has its consequences and we know even today that ishmael's children don't really like isaac's children and it's a big problem in the world and we can't seem to solve this one been going on for thousands of years and we can't solve it because of this sin right here because we didn't couldn't wait on god to work in his timing learn learn something from that next page all right genesis chapter 20 let's go there abraham and abimelech folks this is groundhog day the things that we should have learned down in Egypt, we didn't really learn. It's Groundhog Day. I, one of the things I always say is, you know, if you fail a course, God will make you take it over again. So Abraham failed lying 101, and God makes him take it over again right now. When you fail something, God will make you take it again. When you don't, when you don't get the point of the class, God will make you take it over again. Been there, done that one? There's some things, classes I've taken three or four times. 
opening my mouth, I've taken that class a lot of times. I still haven't passed that one. So, Genesis chapter 20, verse 1. And from there, Abraham journeyed down toward the territory of the Negev, which is down, the Red Sea has two little uh, arms that go up, and this is down towards the right hand, right hand of that. So he's heading down towards Egypt, but he's down in that area of the Negev Desert, and he comes up to on Abimelech, and he's saying, uh, uh, I'm afraid again, I'm weak, you're my sister. Just tell him you're my sister. I'll tell him the same thing, and they, they'll let you live, they won't kill me, we know how this works. Oh yeah, we know how that one works. And so they lied. Let's go down to verse 5. Verse 4, now Abimelech had not approached her, and, she, and he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent person? So the Lord said to Abimelech, if you go into her, you are a dead man. Whoa. The Lord's talking to Abimelech and telling Abimelech, you're a dead man because of this woman who you've taken. She is a man's wife. And now Abimelech had not approached her, he said. So he said, Lord, will you kill innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she's my sister? And she herself said, he's my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in innocence of my hands, I've done this. And then God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you've not done this, that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. God to the rescue again, right, folks? God to the rescue again. Verse 7 And now then, return the man's wife, for he's a prophet. So now God's telling us Abraham's a prophet so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abimelech got it. He got up really early the next morning, took care of it, called the servants, told them what's going on. And Abimelech then said, Abraham, why'd you lie to me? Pray for me. The Lord said you could pray for me. And, and, and Abraham prayed, God healed, and he got out of there. In verse 9, it says this, And then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom such a great sin? You've done to me things that ought not to have been done. Verse 10, And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did these things? And Abraham said, It was because I thought there's no fear of God in all this place, and you will kill me because of my wife. So why did he make his decisions again? Fear. Another weak moment in his life, failed lying 101 again a second time because of fear, not walking in faith. We all know what that's like, folks. We all remember times when we're weak as well. So let's not be too critical of Abraham, but God had to rescue him again to keep his plan going. Okay, now let's look at some positive things that, that happened. Where he was walking with faith. Go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12. He's down in, in Ur, Ur of the Chaldees. And he says in verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your father's country and your kindred and your father's homeland, and I will show you and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so you'll have a big blessing. And I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And in all the families, they'll be blessed. Verse 4, So Abraham went. God says, Go. Abraham went. Folks, how many of us at age 75, if God said, you know what, I know you're 75, I know you think you should be retired, I know you think your life's over, but I want you to go do something important right now. What would you be thinking about the Lord? But Lord, I just want to retire. Lord, I just, I've earned my time to do nothing. Lord, I don't want to serve anymore because what if the young people do it? Lord, Surely you must mean somebody else. You must mean Ben Dart. Ben Dart's young. He's strong. He's good looking. He can do it. What can I do, Lord? I'm 75. It's believers. Should we really ever retire? No. no. The Christian walk is one of non-retirement. When, when you're ready to retire, God will call you. God will call you when it's time to retire. Now, I'm not talking about your work, your thing you do for employment, the thing you do for sustenance. I'm not talking about that. But as believers, we, we're not on the same train that you are in your workplace. We, we do not retire as believers. That's not what we do. That's what we want to do, but we can't do that. 
That's not what God's called us to. So he asks Abraham, he goes, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your friends. I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave your religion. And you're going to go someplace, and I'll tell you about where it's going to be later. This is huge, folks. This is one of those ones where, how do you describe the faith that Abraham had to have to do that? It's huge. Change geography. Change your thinking. Change your religion. Oh, let's, let's just do that like 2,000 miles from here. Okay, that's a good idea. What do you think? Let's go. Let's go, Abraham. Let's go. And they did. Genesis 13. Hop, hop over there. Next one. In verse 8. We're going to pick it up at 13, verse 8. And then Abraham said to Lot. In fact, let me set the stage a little bit because I, I skipped some. So they come back from this severe famine. They were down in Egypt. And they came back. And they were being blessed so much when they came back in this severe famine, that the, the tribesmen of both Lot and Abram were arguing. They were fighting over, the, like, who, who's, who's using this well? Who's getting this field for grass? And they're starting to fight, so they have to separate. Now verse 8. And then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me. Abram is not a selfish guy. He's not trying to be confrontational. He knows God has his back. He knows God will provide. He knows he just screwed up down in Egypt. And he's looking for God to answer that now that they're back in the promised land during the severe famine. God's been blessing them. So he says to, to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen, kinsmen, we're brothers, we're fam. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me, and if you take the left hand, then I'll go right. If you take the right hand, then I'll go left. And Lot looked up, he lifted his eyes, and he saw the Jordan Valley. It was well watered everywhere. So the Jordan Valley run, running from the Sea of Galilee all the way down to the Dead Sea, very fertile valley. Lot looks out, sees it. Yeah, I want that. Abraham says, cool, take it, no problem. Verse 11, so Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other and Abram settled in the land of Canaan. And while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom, now the men of Sodom were wicked and great sinners against the, the Lord. Verse 14, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, so, so Lot's kind of out of ear, ear sight now, or ear hearing. And the Lord says to Abram, Lift up your eyes and look from this place where you are. Look north. Look south. Look east, where Lot just went. Look west, out to the Mediterranean Sea. For all the land that you will see, you can see, I will give it to you and to your offspring how long, folks? Forever. Forever. And I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so, in terms of number, so that if one could count the dust of the earth, your offspring also could be counted. Arise and walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. And so Abram moved his tent and came and settled near the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and in there he built an altar to the Lord. Again, the Lord... And, is just working with Abram, and Abram's walking in faith. He just keeps trusting the Lord to provide, and the Lord does. Abram tries to give it away, and the Lord just gives it back to him. And that's what happens, folks. When we follow the Lord, and, and we think, well, you know, here's 100 bucks. I need to give this 100 bucks to Noel. She's going out on this mission trip. Do you, you think the Lord doesn't find a way to bless you again? Of course he does. Those, talk to those saints that have, that have tried to outgive God. You can't do it. You can't do it. Now, you, we can become selfish and try to hoard it all. But you can't outgive God. Okay, chapter 14, first 12 verses. The northern kings from up around that area of the, the Sea of Galilee and, and up in Damascus and, and where Syria is now, they get the bright idea they're going to come together because there's good things happening down on the south end of the, of the Jordan Valley. We're going to go down there, capture all those cities. We're going to get ourselves some good slaves. We're going to get ourselves some good cows and sheep and goats. Let's go down and take spoil. And they do. They go down, they take spoil, and in the process, they got Lot too. Lot and his whole family, and they drag them up north. And then we come to verse 14, verse 13 of chapter 14. And then one of them who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, that the Amorite, brother of Eskel and of Enur, and these allies of Abram, Abram. And when Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night into three. Now, question for you. So he's got 318 Navy SEALs working for him. 
Where were they when he went to visit Abimelech? What are you afraid of? Where were those 318 Navy SEALs when he went to visit the Pharaoh? Where were they? And then he goes up to attack. So now he's going up to attack multiple kingdoms at the same time with 318 guys. And for fun, he divides them into three. Now, for you non-math majors, how many is that? 106, right? Take 318 divided by 3, 106. So he divided the, the troops up into three groups of 106. And he's going to attack all these multiple kingdoms with no fear. So you can see that he had, these are the people he had with him when he was in Egypt. These are the people he had with him when he was, was down in with Abimelech. But he was moving in fear then. Here he's not moving in fear. He's like, they, they came in, they got a lot. We're going to go get them. We're going to go kick some butt. Let's go. Let's take our Navy SEALs. Everybody all stay home. Wow. Wow. What, what a moment where he's trusting God to provide. All right. Next, Genesis 14. Right after that, he comes back, and he's coming back down. It says this in verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Shedolomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the God Most High, and he blessed him and said to him, Blessed be Abraham by the God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. What, what an amazing moment when he meets Melchizedek. I, I could do a whole sermon on just this section. But Melchizedek is a priest of the Most High God. We have not seen other believers in all these travels. And now we run into this, this, most, this priest of the Most High God who comes from Salem, Jerusalem. And he comes out, and he, what does he say about Abraham? Blessed be Abram the Most High, by God the Most High. Abram is the, and God is the possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. So why did those 318 Navy SEALs win? Because God delivered them into his hands. God was reminding Abraham, I, I know you got Navy SEALs, dude, but it's not because of that. It's because I was with you. Thank you for being faithful and going, getting it done, but... Just know I had your back. Just know that. The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah tried to, to give Abraham something for that. He wouldn't take it. Again, the world's watching. Abraham wanted to make sure that he owed them nothing. He said, look it, just give food to my guys we're gonna, and we're going to go back home. He gave a tithe back to Melchizedek, but he didn't take anything from the people that he had taken things from. The world was watching and Abraham knew the world was watching. And he made sure that his faith walk was faith, was a walk in faith. But we need to be careful with that too, folks. That when we, he, had it, he could have definitely taken advantage of those kings and built his, his wealth even more. If he had asked them for, them for a tithe, they would have easily given it to him. They probably would have whined about it. But they'd have given it to him. They'd have held it against him probably. But he didn't do it. The ultimate one, Genesis 22. Hop over there. Genesis 22. Genesis 22. This is where God is testing Abram, Abraham and asking him to offer his son Isaac. Chapter, and after these things, chapter 22, verse 1, and after these things, God tested Abram and said to him, Abram, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son, oh, by the way, your only son Isaac, oh, by the way, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. God reminded him, not that he needed reminded, oh, by the way, that's your only son. And God reminded him, oh, by the way, he's the one that you love. Take him, that's the one. Take him and go offer him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Wow, wow. So God is the one that puts the test out there and reminds him what he's giving up. Verse 3 tells us, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two young men of his with them, and his son Isaac, and off they went. He didn't debate it with God. He wasn't wringing his hand, what am I going to do? He wasn't saying, God, can we talk about this one again? Are you really sure? I mean, come on, God. This, I hear what you're saying. 
I don't think you really want me to give up my only son, do you? Because remember, didn't you just tell me that he was the one that this line's going to come through? It, you know he's the only one that I, that I really love him. You know that, right? Abram didn't do that. Abraham did not do that. He didn't date with God. He just got up early the next morning and went. That's the one, folks. I, I look at that and I go, wow, wow. I, again, I, 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 don't even, I can't even read it and understand it. Uh, I did, massive faith is, happened there. Massive faith happened there. Verse 14, so Abram called the name of this place, the Lord will provide. And as you know, he did not offer Isaac as a sacrifice. The Lord provided a ram, was in the thicket. He grabbed the ram, put the ram on the, on the sticks, took Isaac off, and they sacrificed the, the, the ram. He called that mount the place the Lord will provide. And that's the mountain, Mount Moriah, where the temple was built later. So where the temple mount is, where the temple was built, was this, this same mountain. There's two mountains there in Jerusalem, Mount Zion and Mount Moriah, and this is the one where the temple was built. Interesting, isn't it? Last one, 23, chapter 23, Sarah's death. Sarah lived 127 years, and these were the years of the life of Sarah, and Sarah died at Kirabera, which is Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from the, before his, his, his dead, and Abraham rose up, from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I'm a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of sight. This is coming to the end of their lives, end of her life for sure. And in verse 5, the Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord, little El, but they recognize him as a very important person. You are a prince of God among us. The world had been watching them their whole life in that promised land. And the world realized that they were, God had his hand upon them. You are a prince of God. Their testimony was sure. God counted it unto Abram as righteousness. They had a faith walk. At the end of their life, their faith walk that the people that were around them saw was one where they're saying, you are a prince of God. You are a prince of God. Kind of a little side trivia. The grace, their grace still exists. Abraham was buried there as well, and Joseph was buried up there as well when he, they brought his bones back. Still exists. It's in Hebron. It's a very revered spot, revered by the Jews, of course, right? Abraham is their, their father. Revered by the Muslims. They, they too recognize Abraham as their father. And revered by the Christians as well. We recognize Abraham's work and our walk. Uh, that piece of land is about nine miles southwest of Jerusalem, and it's part of the controlled West Bank. You can't really get there, but that grave still exists, and thankfully, it's a revered site for everybody, so nobody's d destroying it. All right, let me close with this, and I, I thank you for your patience. I know I'm a little over here. I want to close with Romans chapter 4. You can turn there if you'd like. You don't need to. And there's some thoughts about Abram. Um, I had the opportunity to hear via YouTube Scott Driscoll, or excuse me, Mark Driscoll, speak on, on this chapter. Uh, took him two hours and 15 minutes. I'm going to give it to you in five. Uh, he does an amazing job of just putting these things down to bullet points that makes it clear that God's promise to Abraham is, is activated by faith. And it was activated by faith then, and it's activated by faith now. Romans 4, 1 through 5 says this. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abram, Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as due. So if we do it by works, when we go to work, they pay us, right? We get, they should anyway. You should get a paycheck. We get the paycheck because you've earned it. So you got your paycheck because it was due to you. you. You can't earn salvation that way. It's by faith. That's what Paul's talking about here when he's writing to the Romans. Verse 5, And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness 
Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from the works. Uh, this is verses 7 and 8 in Romans, but it's also Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So when we're saved, when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, he doesn't count our sin anymore. It's as far as the east is from the west, as far as your right hand can get from your left hand. Completely destroyed. The sin is gone. Covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And the Jews kept trying to make it the law. They, they kept, even to the Christians that were getting saved out of the Jewish religion, they kept trying to make it the law. And folks, I would contend to you today that many denominations, many evangelical Christian denominations keep trying to make it the law. We keep trying to get people to fix their wagon before they come to Christ. We should be coming to Christ and the Holy Spirit will fix your wagon. We, wanting people to dress a certain way and to stop doing this and stop doing that and doing that before they can come in the door to, to find us and find the Lord Jesus Christ, that, folks, that's backwards. That is exactly what the Lord was preaching against. That's exactly what Abraham's life was about. Walk in faith. And in that walk of faith, from that faith to faith, the Lord will fix your wagon. It might take a lifetime. Some of you are pretty rough. I didn't call anybody out by name. So, a few bullet points. Here's six bullet points from Mark Driscoll. One, we need to have faith in God so that we too can become a friend of God. It's about relationship. Brother Dan is always reminding us that it's about relationship. Relationship with our Father. Because the second bullet point, when we have that kind of relationship with our Father, we have no choice but to have a great relationship with our brothers. One good sign that you're struggling in your relationship with God is you're struggling in your relationships with each other. Abraham, this is another great point, I love this. Abraham was not looking for God. God was looking for him. God came to him in Ur and said, oh, by the way, I want you to leave here and we're going to go. Abraham was not sitting down someday going, you know, I wonder, wonder if there's a real God. I wonder who he is. We may be, you and I may be. God is always looking for us even when we're looking for him. But, so God is looking for us. Next bullet point. We, all of us, have more knowledge of and about God than Abraham would ever have. We have more knowledge about God than Abraham ever had, yet as a society we trust God less, we believe his word less, and we struggle to obey him as well. Ouch. We should not expect to be the recipients of God's blessing, but we should expect to be the conduit. In other words, as God is blessing you, filling your cup and your cup's pouring over, he's asking you not to let it stop there. Be the conduit, not the recipient. Let it keep flowing. Keep it flowing. Keep it flowing. And God will keep blessing. Keep it flowing. Follow God's will and follow his timing. Follow both things. Do not get ahead of God. Deal with what he's put in front of you right now. Oftentimes he'll give you something to do right there in front of you and we can't see it because we're trying to look around the next corner. We shouldn't be trying to look on the next corner. We should be dealing with what's right here. What's right here in front of us. Deal with that. When you cross the bridge, that's when you worry about things. Oftentimes, Charlotte and I will be having a, vacation, or a conversation. She'll be saying, well, what about this? What about that? What about that? Sure. We don't even know if that's true. Let's cross that bridge when we get there. When that becomes true, and it's right in front of us, then we'll deal with that one. But right now, the Lord's put this right in front of us. Well, let's deal with what's right in front of us. Uh, good wisdom there. Good wisdom. God spoke.